Okay. Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. I am really thrilled to be here with Jeff DePauli and um, David Bertolino. We're going to be talking about Spooky World in uh, Massachusetts. All about it, all of your, you know, burning questions answered. Before we get to it, just want to say a couple things. One is I'd like to thank the friends of the Ashland Public Library who support all of our programming. I'd also like to thank Jeff and David for letting us partner with other pro uh, libraries in Massachusetts for this program because, you know, when libraries get together, we make magic, just like Halloween magic, and we have today. So um, there's that. I'd also like to thank Alexander DeColibus of Halloween New England, who was an early adopter, introduced me to Jeff, and really started the domino of this series, because there's four uh, programs in the series about different haunted places that we're going to talk about through the month. Um, for you that don't know, Jeff DePauli is the uh, originator and host of That Halloween Podcast. He's a huge Halloween fan, also Disney, interestingly enough. So I'm going to hand it over to Jeff to do all the rest of the work. He's going to be talking with David for about 50 to 55 minutes. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we will try to get to them. Have a wonderful time. I can't wait to hear everything you guys have to say. Excellent, Mina. Thank you for the intro. And uh, I will just say, believe it or not, the Halloween and uh, horror Disney crossover is is quite uh, quite extreme, actually, the, the fans there. But in any case, David Bertolino, welcome. And thank you so much for doing this today. The creator you, of Spooky World. My goodness. Uh, so it's funny. So I'm in Burbank, California, and you're in North Hollywood, right? Yes, we're neighbors. And we're neighbors, but we're both Massachusetts guys. I grew up in Woburn, Massachusetts, so I grew up with Spooky World. And you grew up kind of Boston and then, you know, did Spooky World in Massachusetts and everything. So we're both East Coasters now living uh, in sunny, on the sunny West Coast, right? Yes. All right. Well, let's jump into our conversation about Spooky World because... Listen, if you grew up in the 90s in Massachusetts and you're a Halloween fan, you certainly know what Spooky World is. If people don't, can you give a kind of a brief description, David, of, of sure. what Spooky yeah. World was? Well, Spooky World was a, um, a thought that came to mind after several cocktails <laughs> and thinking, wouldn't it be cool to just go on a hayride? And uh, living in Sudbury at the time, uh, I tried to make a reservation for Drumlin Animal Farm, which is in Lincoln. And uh, they were sold out for the week. Make a long story short, they were sold out for the month. And I thought, oh, my God, hayrides are really popular again. That's wonderful. How nostalgic. But the following day, a friend of mine who's involved in the Warwick Mall in Rhode Island called me up and he said, hey, Look at the front page of USA Today. There's a guy who is doing a hayride and he has these little Halloween skits along his hayride trail. And I said, oh, my God, you know, it's just a coincidence that I was looking at going to a hayride. So being as impulsive wacko as I am, <laughs> I jumped on a plane with him and took a shuttle to Philadelphia. We drove to Egg Harbor, New Jersey, and we went on this terrible hayride and uh but i you know tongue in cheek i kind of enjoyed it it was campy it was ridiculous but they were charging ten dollars a person and the line was a mile long to get on and i thought oh my god i could do this because i am in the halloween industry i grew up in my parents joke and magic shop uh called little jack corner in downtown boston we had this huge Halloween department that we did all year long. And you got to remember, this is back in the late 80s uh, or 1990 ish. And you didn't have all of these Halloween temporary superstores and you didn't have the options. So uh, our joke and magic shop was a mecca of uh, Halloween supplies for anyone interested in doing a little home haunt or something like that. And so uh, there's my interest of providing props and displays to home haunters. And I'm already in the Halloween industry. And so uh, my friend and I decided to partner and uh, do this little hayride. 
you know, try to find a farm. Uh, in my quest to find a farm, I signed a lease with a bank who had a foreclosure on a dairy farm that was abandoned and people were trying to make it into a conference center. And so I went to the town, which is of Berlin, and came up with an agreement that allowed me, allows me the licensing uh, to put on this event. And they never thought it would work out. Uh, but just the same, uh, you know, I gave it a shot. And uh, just before we're ready to start construction, I get a call from the FDIC saying, hey, we're, you know, you, we're not going to honor your lease, but you can buy the farm for very little money down and it would be the payments that you would have paid for rent. So just moving quickly, I buy this farm. I'm shoveling out horse manure in all of the stalls of the dairy farm. And uh, we refurbish a barn and we open up this hayride. And that's how Spooky World started. And it was just, it was crazy, but it was on a fluke. That's, that is wild. And like, so this was your family business, right? But did you, um, were you like a huge Halloween fan or did you just kind of fall into it because it was your family business? And, you know, I always enjoyed Halloween. Uh, you know, we grew up, you know, fairly low income family in Brighton, Massachusetts, so I remember, you know, uh, as a little kid that I would wear uh, what I didn't realize was a Santa Claus uh, wig and beard. And uh, my mom would use uh, whatever inexpensive makeup that she used to buy at Woolworths. And uh, I was this character, <laughs> for lack of a better word. But I, you know, I was convinced I was, the, you know, the best costume outfit in my uh you know, poor little neighborhood, but thoroughly enjoyed Halloween. And then it was just phenomenal to have your dad uh, have a joke and magic shop. And suddenly you're, you're, you know, the family's in the Halloween business big time. Uh, but the transition was now I, I branch out to the entertainment side of Halloween. And, uh, you know, it was a happy accident. Very nice. So, you know, what was it exactly about this farm like, that we got pictured here? This, uh, I mean, such a cool location for a hunt, but was it really just kind of you, you fell upon it and it just happened? Or were you, did you see this location and say, this is the place for Spooky World? Well, as the documentary that we're about to release shows that um, I looked high and low to find a location. Uh, I drove the highways of 495, 290, 128. And uh, I made sure I only drove within a half mile of each of those exits because I knew that I want a uh, presence that is a visual that people don't have to drive through a small community. Uh, and so I found this in Berlin, made the offer to rent. The rental turned out to be a purchase, bought the farm literally. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, Jeff, we only had five and a half acres. And my partner and I um, agreed that half of that would be parking spots. Oh, wow. But of course, by the time the first night happened, we ran out of parking. So I had to rent 10 acre fields in, you know, directly across from us, uh, then aside from us. I mean, we wound up with 20 acres of parking and we filled it every night. Uh, it was quite an endeavor. It's unbelievable how, how fast this thing grew just in its first year. Uh, here's a, a photo of some early days of the hayride. Can you talk to me a bit about those early days of building it? Because I'm going to assume it was very like homegrown, didn't necessarily have like a massive team of carpenters and stuff. So so what was it like building it in those early days? Well, you know, my dad, who was probably at that time about in his mid to late 60s, would show up every morning with coffees and I would hire local carpenters in the town. I knew politically that's the right thing to do. And so we had about a half a dozen carpenters swinging hammers and saws and so forth. And, you know, quickly ran out of money. And um, the bottom line is you can't do this with zero money. But I had a friend of mine who owed me money. 
at one time on some business transactions and he went bankrupt and I felt so bad for him. And when I ran into him, I said, you know, he said, oh, you must hate me. And I said, no, not at all. You know, I said, you really worked hard and tried to make your business happen. He says, well, it actually did happen. Uh, he sold his company to Bain Capital for $9 million. And he wanted me to go back to his office to chat. And he asked me, you know, what, what would it take to uh, make this, you know, what you vision? And I said, oh, my God, I, I need probably $150,000. And um, he went into his inner office, came out with a check for 150000 And, you know, we agreed on an interest rate. But I was shocked. I mean, not even signing any paperwork. He trusted me. I trusted him. And, you know, I had a 10-year loan at the time. And uh, P.S., to accelerate this, I paid off that 10-year loan in three weeks of operating Spooky World. That's what I find so amazing. It's just, I mean, getting butts in seats, I find to be the most difficult thing about, uh, you know, throwing events. You, you had such an extreme success. Like you said, three weeks to pay off a debt that was supposed to be 10 years or something. Like, what really led to that success? Was it just insane marketing? Was it there was nothing to, you know, obviously the early 90s, it it was Halloween wasn't the billion dollar industry it is today. Well, I'm going to let you in on a huge secret that I have not shared with, you know, we've been counting, uh, you know, we've been in this festival circuit. We've done two huge film festivals and we're up to 30 some odd interviews. And I'm going to reveal something I haven't revealed to any of the other interviewers. And that is you are looking at the least creative person <laughs> in the room. And I'm, I admit that and happy to admit it because I surrounded myself with some very creative people, amongst them, Tom Savini, who is a master special effects person involved in the film industry. And he came year one uh, to sign autographs and to you know help support some of the build out of the Hayride Trail. And his touch, his creativity, his vision was phenomenal. And so he gave us ideas of effects that probably were, you know, movie worthy. And we implemented this on it. You can remember, this is a huge old dairy farm and we carve out a trail. We build 22 platform stage sets and we populate it with actors who are really, you know, not actors, but a lot of wannabe actors. And so, uh, we created a ghoul school to train them. And, you know, if it wasn't for Tom and a number of other people who uh, shared in the effort, there would be no spooky world. And his, his touch was phenomenal. So I have to say a big credit to Tom Savini. That's Tom Savini, folks, on your screen right now. I'm not sure, David, can you see the I know you're on your yes, phone. Yes, I can. can. OK, yeah. cool. So there's Tom on the screen. How exactly did he get involved? Because, as you said, he was working in Hollywood doing a lot of film special effects and such. So how sure. did you meet him? Uh, a, a mutual friend had me reach out. Uh, we met and he found the whole project intriguing. He um, flew out to Boston and uh, we became very fast friends. He actually moved into the farmhouse, stayed on oh, the really? second floor. And, uh, and he came back season after season. And uh, he, he actually wrote two books in, in the wing of the house that he was living in, in on our property. Huh. But, you know, that was at night. During the day, he was on the Hayride Trail, uh, along with directing the carpenter crew and, the you know, all the support staff and the display people that we had. And Tom Zavini had a very big part in the history of Spooky World. I mean, for many reasons, but he really named it right what was the original name of, of yeah it was spooky hayrides in year one mm -hmm. and um you know night after night uh i was quite emotional and tom said what's your problem you're, you're having great success and i'm getting teary-eyed because we're turning people away and the people that did go there had to wait in line for an hour so it was just embarrassing to me but you know as Tom would remind me, this is a great problem to have to turn guests away and not to worry about it. And, uh, you know, 
during that time, we were talking about future plans. And he said, you know, I don't like the name Spooky Hayrides. Let's add a haunted house. And uh, let's add a haunted house every year. you got to give people new stuff. And I totally agreed. Uh, I did want to hear um, a comment of, you know, the following year where people would say, hey, have you gone to Spooky Hayrides? And the answer is yes, so I don't need to go anymore. <clears throat> so Tom's idea was emulate, you know, the Disney model of Disneyland or Disney World. And I like World, so I coined it Spooky World. And we changed the name, called the attorney back and said, well, you know, we just incorporated into the Spooky Hayrides name. Well, it's OK. Let's update it three weeks later. Now it's Spooky World. And again, we added on all these added attractions every year to make it, you know, greatly expanded uh, entertainment. But the nice thing about it, um, we didn't delete uh, what we created. So uh, if you enjoyed a certain haunted house in year three, four or five, it didn't disappear and be renamed something else. And so I always liked that model, just keep adding on and not replacing things, just add on. And, uh, you know, there was something for everybody at, at Spooky World. Were you considering the expansion yourself at all? Or were, were you really just focusing on, oh, this is going to be a hayride, that's the business? Or were yeah. you thinking, oh, eventually we've got to add haunted houses and such? Or was that there really was no fun? book. There was no insight for year two. We dealt with yeah. year one. We respond to what the audience liked, what wanted. Uh, you know, we just had so many ideas. And year after year, you would see an implementation of all new, you know, happenings. Uh, it was a sensory overload to come to Spooky World. And it was one of those things where you go to work the next day and I'm standing at the water cooler and you tell people, oh, my God, I saw Bobby Boris Pickett singing the Monster Mash or Tiny Tim was in line singing Tiptoe Through the Tulips while we were waiting in line entertaining us. Or we went through a museum that Tom Savini populated with some of his own creations from first-run horror movies. And he reached out to his friends. He re reached out to John Carpenter, Wes Craven. We've got a lot of pieces in that museum uh, that were donated thanks to Tom Savini. What do you think is something in year one that the audience really responded well to that you're like, okay, we've got to have that every year. And then something that maybe wasn't responded to so well. And you're like, well, here's the happy okay, accident. We're gonna make the the line is long. You picture yourself waiting to go on a hayride. That's all it was in year one, a hayride. And looking at that, I immediately call to action street performers. So we had Dead Elvis and the Colonel. Mm -hmm. We had a juggler who would jump on a huge ball and juggle flaming torches. We added walk around zombies. I mean, I know this is a stretch, but we found a barbershop quartet with all these, these guys were in their eighties, but we added some makeup to make them zombie looking. And it was just uh, a Fellini movie <laughs> in action. You know, this whole cavalcade of, uh, crazy looking characters that uh, populated the whole queue line, the, the waiting areas. So the, the, the queue line became part of the show. And so again, you know, that was an immediate addition. That was a call to ac action night after night. We would just expand those walk around characters. And it sounds like you lucked out a little bit with year one, at least as far as weather is concerned, because anybody in Massachusetts tuning in or New England knows that you know, unpredictable weather can destroy an outdoor haunt season, but it sounds like it went pretty okay for you year one. Well, here's another advantage. We, uh, Fred Sherman became our vice president. Fred, by the way, I discovered him in line waiting to go on a hayride. Hmm. And I had a habit of talking to people. And I went to him and I started saying, you know, what brings you here? And he says, oh, my wife sold you some advertising for the tab newspaper. And I said, oh, that's that's great. And um, I said, what do you do? And he said, oh, I produced a show on TV called People Are Talking with Tom Bergeron. Well, I took him out of line, brought him to the front of the line. We went on the hayride. We chatted. And the next thing, by the next day, he was vice president of Spooky Hayrides. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we became fast friends. And 
Fred's connections, you know, it's funny, people bring you their world and Fred's world was broadcast media. And so he introduced me to um, uh, somebody from marketing at BZ to create a contest. He introduced me to uh, the sales department where I was able to buy what's called a remnant advertising, which is oh. basically unsold advertising for pennies on the dollar. So if a sponsor cancels some commercial or doesn't like a certain show or whatever and decides at the last minute, I would come in and buy it at what's called remnant prices. And as a result, it, that explore, you know, you asked me what made the change. Well, all of these things I'm talking about made the change. It was a multiple, you know, truly an ensemble effort. So that's why I say to you, I am the least creative person in the room. I am going to go back to the, the question, though, of the weather. How did that work out for you? Uh, oh, during... I, I'm sorry. That's I didn't uh, I didn't thread that properly. Uh, Fred introduced me to Bruce Schwegler and Bruce was the weather forecaster. And I'd always, you know, not in year one, we didn't have it, but from year two on, I would call Bruce and to ask him about weather patterns. And mm -hmm. he would tell me where to gauge uh, the measurement of rain, whether it should be in Worcester or Providence or Boston. And with his help, and I, there's nothing illegal about this, I guess it's legalized gambling. I was able to successfully gauge my rain insurance. And I got to tell you something, when, the, <laughs> you, <laughs> when you gauge it properly, it's quite successful. Now, you know, just like any gambler, you know, at the casino, you could have a bad run. But damn it, Schwegler, with his advice, we actually, you know, made made out very well. We're, you know, there's certain insurances that will not allow you to open if they to clear a rain out. And I went after the insurance companies that not only would let you stay open in a rain, but pay you off depending upon the amount that you predict it will rain that night. So we, we did very wow. well predicting the, the, the rain. And again, there's your answer on weather. Uh, I had not the, heard that we made, story. We made the most of it. That's genius. I love it. Now, one of the things that that Spooky World became very famous for was the stars that it brought in. Uh, you can see here, of course, Elvira, Linda Blair, Alice Cooper, and many others like Kane Hodder and uh, Robert England. And, you know, listen, this is a small town in Massachusetts. They're not used to like Hollywood celebrities being around. And how early did they start coming? Was it year one, year two? Well, the first year uh, I had Tommy there and um, I also reached out to Kane Harder, who's Jason, on Friday the 13th. And I reached out to Gunnar Hansen, who was a Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And they appeared, all three appeared. Oh, and I'm sorry, in Butch Patrick, Eddie Munster. They appeared all 31 nights. On year in, one? In year one. Wow. Yeah. But then uh, by year two, I tracked down, uh, I kept writing to Linda Blair, crickets, no response. And uh, I reached her, her, her mom who lived in Westport, Connecticut. Uh, and I actually, this is an interesting story. I had to go to the Westport Town Hall and discovered an unpaid excise tax bill on a vehicle. And then I realized, okay, that's where she lives because that somebody gave me a hint that they were in Westport. And I reached out to mom and said, look, I've got a family friendly audience. You know, if Linda's visiting you uh, in the fall, she, you know, it's not a long drive. It's about two hours, two and a half hours from Westport. Uh, please get her to do my event. Mom convinced Linda, but, you know, Linda was reluctant about it. She's never, at that point, didn't she didn't do autograph signing. She didn't realize the value of her autograph. But we brought her there, and I promised her, you know, she if she didn't like it, she could go back the very first night. She loved it. She had a ball. She signed autographs and, uh, you know, met the fans. And uh, as many of these celebrities, they... They, returning, we even have, any celebrity that appeared always wanted to return again because A, the revenue was great on signing the autographs and they would keep 100% of the revenue. Our uh, 
Post Hotel, which was the embassy suites, provided free housing for the celebrities because here was the deal we had with them. Uh, they have a breakfast buffet from 6 to 10 a.m. every morning. And they wanted the celebrities to appear and eat their breakfast in this huge plaza that they populated with all their rooms. And so the agreement was, you know, they found a benefit to have celebrities, you know, populate their dining areas uh, every morning in October. So we got free rooms for the celebrities and they got suites and the celebrities enjoyed the treatment. And um, it, obviously the guests of Embassy Suites loved meeting the, these Halloween celebrities during every October. That's hilarious. So really year one, you got them out. I mean, what were you promising them? Was it just a money thing? You had nothing to show that this would work. Well, I had to subsidize their appearance with an appearance fee because okay. nobody believed they can make revenue uh, during, the, you know, for the to, to stay there for a month, especially. So I it was every chance. night, right? Every they single were working night. Every night, you know, yeah. six to midnight. You know, it was a long shift for them, actually. October but 1st it, to October 31st. Exactly. But wow. it, it proved well, so much so by second year. I removed the appearance fee and they just strictly kept the revenue and they did quite well. I mean, if you sign back then, I think the autographs were only 10 and $20. I mean, Linda now charges $90 for an autograph. Elvira is 120 for an autograph. But back then, uh, the autograph collecting was not as strong as it is now. And, you know, back then it was maybe 10 or $20 for an autograph photograph of the, um, uh, of the celebrity yeah so wild and as you mentioned you got musical acts as well bobby boris pickett famous for the monster mash tiny tim tiptoeing through the tulips and they became part of the i believe it was called the scary Oki, right yes we built uh you know on year one we had just a mound of dirt in an elevated little mountain and they would sing on the top of that uh, and quite frankly, we had just bullhorns the first week. Then we put in a sound system. <laughs> By year two, that was a platform with a stage and curtains and an ensemble of added, you know, background guests singing. And uh, but the karaoke guy, we called it Scaryoke, would invite people from the audience to sing along, you know, their favorite Halloween tunes. And that that was wonderful. It just worked out so great. It was so community. It was wonderful. What was Bobby Boris Pickett doing at the time? Obviously, the Monster Mash never went away. But I assume, <laughs> I, I don't think he was like, you know, from the 60s through the 80s performing this music regularly, was he? No, I, I don't know. Uh, he was kind of, I don't want to say secretive, but he never really expanded on his personal life. And, um, but I mean, you know, he did such a great job. I mean, he and no bones about it, by the way, no you know, not being pretentious, he would come out and say, folks, I'm going to now do a medley of my one hit. <laughs> and, you know, but I mean, that one hit he co-wrote and he made the residuals and, uh, you know, he made a living from it, apparently. Unbelievable. Now, you say you're not a creative guy, but if you're in charge of uh, this next thing, uh oh, where'd my mouse go? There we go. You are the master of media gimmicks. And what we see here is Tiny Tim getting married live on The Tonight Show at Spooky World. And this was just one of your many, many media gimmicks. Where did where did all of this come from? You know, I never went by uh, protocol, you know, what is proper for the entertainment industry. And I just did what I felt was right. And I guess, you know, some people will call it, you know, using the phone as a weapon. But, uh, you know, I would call, you know, you know, throughout the whole time of Spooky World, every January and February, I would call every reporter that did the story the year before. I would call all the network affiliates and tell them, hey, we're, you know, manned, we're staffed, and we're building our hayride trail as we're clearing off snow off the hayride trail. And, you know, I think it's a good idea to engage the press 
So they're rooting for you. And, and that's what, you know, it's all about. They want, and so I'd call in January or February, I give them an update in the spring, I'd call them in the summer, telling them what exciting new things we're doing. I was not somebody who was gonna call the day before we opened looking for press. And so that, you know, that attitude um, uh, you know, to share what we're doing and have them root for us went a long way. And, uh, and I didn't know that's, the right way or the wrong way. There was no book to read on this one. We just, you know, did our thing and it somehow it worked out quite well. But uh, when it came to the Tiny Tim thing, I called uh, the Tonight Show with Jay Leno and I said, okay, you had uh, Tiny Tim get married 30 or 40 years earlier with Johnny Carson on the show. We're going to be uh, doing a new marriage, uh, Tiny's new wife, uh, live from Spooky World, would you like to join us? And we were turned down. But um, within a day or two later, they called back and said, you know what, we're going to do that. Not only are we going to do it, but we're going to have Bill Maher broadcast it. So he's our roving reporter. We'll send him to um, uh, Spooky World and have him, you know, moderate this live broadcast on national TV. Millions of people saw it. It was phenomenal. Wild, absolutely wild. And yeah, I think, I mean, I think you did the right thing, right? As far as keeping, it was all about connections, it sounds like for you, as far as the media. And that is 100% the right way to do it, reaching out when you don't need them as well. But, you know, something I actually don't know, David, at the point of doing Spooky World, were you making your entire annual income in one month? Or are you still doing the joke shop or anything like that? Well, Yes, I was making my income, but yes, I still continued to do my other Halloween activities, which, which at the time was national sales manager of Ruby's Costume Company, as well as um, as a result of being with Ruby's Costume and the Halloween theme park, I was also brought on as an expert witness uh, at uh, from New Line Cinema, and they had... Uh, copyright, trademark infringement cases. And I was recognized in the federal court system uh, as somebody who would uh, give credibility to the, you know, in the favor of New Line on the products that were being infringed upon by knockoff copycats. Interesting. Wow. Uh, speaking of more media gimmicks we got here, if... There we go. Willard Scott from the Today Show. How did this yes. come about? Yeah, and that's, by the, that's my dad to the far right. Oh, nice. Way. With yeah. his Boston costume shirt. Yeah, you know, he, he's equally uh, uh, as affectionately as I've been called a media whore as me. So he promoted Boston <laughs> costume at the time. But yes, yeah, so that, uh, that was um, Greg Lano over at uh, WBZ TV, who, um, you know, I said, what's a, a shortcut to get additional publicity without me paying for it? Now, you, I'm asking a sales guy this. But, you know, when you ask in January and February, it's not as, you know, it's more methodical and you can plan ahead. And his answer was, we've got to get you on the weather. And I said, well, how do we do that? And he said, you know, Children's Hospital is the pet uh, charity uh, for WBZ. Can you make a substantial donation? And I said, Jesus, I don't know about that. Well, one of my staff people took a one week vacation uh, to Aruba and he was lying out. You know, we're always selling. Right. He was lying out by the pool and the guy next to him was talking and he explained, you know, he worked at Spooky World and the guy was fascinated. And this fellow worked at John Aruder, I think his name was worked at um, the promotions and, and charity side of uh, TJ Maxx. And so I get a call from Aruba. Hey, David, say hello to John. He's uh, part of the charity arm for TJ Maxx. I said, John, I need your help. You need to make a donation so we can have Willard Scott come to Spooky World. And he says, well, what's in it for us? I said, I'll have a TJ Maxx night. All the employees of TJ Maxx get in for free. Done. So now we have, you know, Willard Scott doing the weather hit for us. We give a $36,000 donation to, I'm sorry, $52,000 donation to the Children's Hospital. 
And Bob Lobel embraces it. We're at his telethon. I mean, it was just, the gift kept on giving. It was wonderful. It all tied in very well. That's hilarious. And then, you know, more gimmick stuff. You had Linda Blair signing cans of pea soup at Spooky World. Of course, pea soup is what she vomited in the movie she's famous for. So, uh, yeah. I mean, dude, you're creative. <laughs> if this was we, your uh, idea, you're creative. We called, uh, there's a company called Burritos. It's a natural, I don't even know if they're around anymore. It might not be. But we would get every year a skid, which was, I think, 600 cans, if I'm not mistaken of pea soup and Linda would sign it. You make my head spin, Linda Blair. And uh, I think we were selling them. She was selling them for like 40 or $60. We would sell out. I, sometimes we'd have like, you know, 30 or 40 cans left over. And guess what I was eating on my menu all of November and December, a lot of pea soup. But um, so yeah, it just worked out nicely. It was wonderful. And it was, it, you know, it's funny. I, I, doing this um you know created this documentary called spooktacular and i've uh was recently at a film festival that that we uh had a great turnout in austin another film festival here in la that we just finished that was and fantastic. Uh, i was there i was wonderful so people are telling me as their meet and greet area that you know, both austin and la they're telling me i still have my can of pea soup it's on my desk <laughs> It's like, oh, that's great, man. <laughs> uh, that's unbelievable. Now, we've been talking about media a bit, and we've got to talk about this jingle that became synonymous with Spooky World. Can you sing it for me, please? It's America's horror theme park, Spooky World. It was haunting it's for people. It was just haunting. <laughs> well, here's the thing. It's the most jovial haunted house jingle it, I've it, ever it, you heard know, in my life. Tongue in cheek, it's fun. You know, we tried to target family friendly. I know it's a horror Halloween theme park, but it was family friendly. And, you know, I, I got a little uh, pushback from some of, you know, like Dunkin' Donuts was a little concerned about the bloody scenes. And they were what always suggesting. Yeah, were you know, the sponsors. Yeah. yeah. So Dunkin' was one of them. Pepsi was another saying, can you soften this up? And I said, I can't. I said, but I, I'll tell you what I'll do. Now that I have six haunted houses, We'll rate them one to five skulls. So that way there, you know, a little kid doesn't go into an area that's too overwhelming and the parents can judge what level of scare level that, that they attend. In addition, I created, uh, well, here's the story. <laughs> uh, I call my next door neighbor, Rex Trailer. Do you remember Rex? The name Rex Trailer familiar, had a show huh? called Boomtown. Okay. On the, on the NBC affiliate WBC. And he was, you know, he had a kid's show every Saturday and Sunday morning from seven to 10 o'clock. And it was a huge hit. I mean, all the little kids, you know, my age at the time were watching that. And I thought, how nostalgic it would be if Rex represented a new arm, a new addition to Spooky World. So uh, I said, I called Rex and I said, Rex, we are merging with the Boston Children's Halloween Festival. And he said, well, what's that? It's, uh, you know, child, children style, uh, little walkthroughs, kitty style. It's uh, a bonfire with, you know, uh, either a singer like yourself or a, a storyteller, you know, G-rated, uh, not too scary of a Halloween story. Uh, walk around characters. So I got Cartoon Network and, and Nickelodeon to supply these walk arounds, you know, SpongeBob and uh, uh, who, who else was popular? There was a Hey Arnold, a number of walk arounds. And so, uh, and I said, I need you in the studio tomorrow. We'll do cut a commercial. And so Rex did the commercial. Folks, I'm here to announce it's merging. Spook, spooky world has now merged with the boston children's halloween festival and he outlined all of these you know additions that we had now i'm embarrassed to say the following and again you i don't know you bring out the truth in me that you you, you <laughs> must give me truth serum but i've never <laughs> said this in any of my interviews it's my special skill sir go ahead let's hear it 
Rex walks off the set of this commercial and said, now, David, I just promoted this Boston Children's Halloween Festival that you merged with. Who are they? Where are they now? And I pointed to my head and I said, it's all up here. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, they really don't exist. But I'm adding it. I'm creating the Boston Children's Halloween Festival. So now it's two theme parks in one. He said, you had me lie in a TV commercial. I said, well, it's not lying. I'm going to deliver everything you just promised. So, you know, we now had the Boston Children's Halloween Festival that, that at New Year, I think it was 96 or 97. And it was a, I'm going to tell you something. Our numbers popped from about, six or eight thousand a night to about ten thousand a night with wow. the addition of mom dad and the kids with strollers coming in and they came early you know because they're bringing little kids so we actually instead of opening the park at seven we opened the park at five and we got an additional turnover which was wonderful you're doing and now the- it's more family friendly so dunkin donuts embraced it uh you know i think it was i party at the time or i think i party ch- changed uh, party city but anyway we got additional family friendly sponsors to uh to support this you literally did what the theme parks do now places like disneyland and such where they'll have their normal operating day and then they'll close and have a special ticketed like separate event that people pay again to go. You were doing that by like extending this and having a children's time period, essentially. That's genius. Indeed. And I just I just want to note here, folks, I've seen the documentary Spooktacular. It is spectacular. But some of these stories David's telling here, I've never heard before. We've chatted many times at this point. Uh, so, wow, you really are revealing stuff here that people haven't heard. So that's amazing. I want to play this uh, next quick video for you. There's no sound with it, but uh, David, if you can see it, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the stuff you're seeing here? This is video from Spooky World. Look at those lines. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. Just wild. And Okay, the mouse girl. That's the most photographed display at Spooky World was the mouse girl. She actually had about 200 mice crawling over her licking peanut butter off of her. And her only complaint was, can you please switch from chunky to smooth because they're biting me? (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That's amazing. I love that. So, (laughs) oh, yeah. I mean, listen, the stars, you got Robert England there, it's Freddy Krueger. It it was a wild, wild specific time. But eventually you were forced out of Berlin, right? Yes, I don't, you know, I don't want to point fingers, uh, but uh, the uh, building inspector, along with one um, one selectman, uh, made the decision uh, to go approach the state uh, under the protest of the other selectmen, all, of, all the other politicians, but it happened and they, you know, these two prevailed in getting us shut down. And that's when we uh, had uh, our arrangement with uh, Gillette Stadium and the Kraft family moved us to Foxborough. So I grew up with the Foxborough thing. That's what I went to. I am very sad to say I did not experience it on the original farm. I would kill to. My experience on the original farm is simply the, the souvenir VHS that you sold. I know. Had, oh my gosh, that that's that's my experience with the farm. Just watching it on my TV, but you know, it's um, funny. We both are friends with uh, the great David Markland, and David invited uh, me to his event this year and and have a you know little table where I'd sign posters. And, and I told David, I said, "Who's going to want my signature?" We 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 gave away four hundred signed posters, and some of the people were bringing memorabilia knowing that i was there it was in the advanced uh, advertising i signed several of those vh tapes and surprisingly you know i made that tape just to sell in our gift shop a visit to spooky world and i was making 600 of them well i sent a copy to a friend of mine who brought it to spencer gifts spencer ordered twenty-four thousand copies 
<laughs> so it was in every Spencer gift throughout the country. So when people bring me this thing to sign now, I ask them, did you go to Spooky World? Oh, no. I bought this at Spencer Gifts in Florida or Arizona. So I'm just amazed at the national attention this uh, video got. It's phenomenal. You know, I, I bought the video at Spooky World, and I regret to say when I was at that period in time when I was transitioning everything to DVD, I burned it to DVD and got rid of the VHS and absolutely regret it because I would love to have it now. You can find it on eBay, but it's going for several hundred dollars at this point. Yeah, exactly. If you get a sealed copy, it's two or three hundred dollars. It's incredible. Absolutely crazy. So you do you, so these photos here. You can kind of see of, of the abandoned spooky world in its original location. But you eventually go to Foxborough Stadium where I experienced it. At that point in the documentary, there's kind of this feeling that like, the, you know, the true spooky world died in berlin and foxborough it was just a different thing did you feel that way at the time did you feel like it was just kind of the beginning of the end or well you know it's funny some of the purists and, and you know it, it's you know i mean i don't know how to categorize this but i think that um there are some who will say oh it doesn't have the magic the smell of the horse manure i get that uh the uh natural fog because we're in a little depressed valley so every night, people thought we had fog machines on. No, no, that's the natural fog of those meadows. Uh, mm -hmm. So granted, behind Gillette Stadium in their wood, wooded area didn't have the same feel. But we had higher tech. We had a higher, you know, much greater budget to do what we needed to do in Foxborough. And ultimately, Berlin can only handle maybe three or 4,000 people a night. Foxborough, we were hitting 12,000 people a night. So a lot wow. more people saw Foxborough than they did Berlin, but Berlin did have a magic. There's no question about it. And you eventually did sell Spooky World. I believe it was 2005 you sold it, right? What was yeah, uh, it? It's actually now in, uh, in New Hampshire, um, and it spooks every night in October. And what so, made you, you know, people, it's, they, it's Nightmare New England Spooky World. And uh, uh, the two fellows out there, uh, Michael and Wayne, operate it. They're giving it their all. And uh, they have a hayride. They have haunted houses. They have a midway. They actually added, you know, miniature golf, uh, go-karts. I mean, it's a whole menagerie of entertainment there. But what made you decide to sell it ultimately? You know, it it was time. I, um, I, you know, I just, I did it a long time, a long run. My partner, who I started this with, passed away. Mm. And, uh, and I just didn't have the drive after he was gone to uh, continue. And I just wanted a new chapter in my life. Yeah. But I got to tell you, it's so rewarding to look back, especially with this movie happening now. I mean, I'm... As you know, we screen this thing and we're getting a huge, I mean, phenomenal amount of reviews and all the reviews are positive. I mean, we're getting actually phone calls from uh, networks that are interested in having discussions of a scripted TV series at this point. So it's like, can this happen? This is just wonderful. So, you know, Spooktacular is the documentary. Obviously, you've been working on this, I think, since 2019. It's been a while, but talk to me about that gap, 2005 to 2019. I mean, since I've known you, it's been very much Spooky World has still been a big part of your life. Was Were you still, you know, known as the Spooky World guy, or is the documentary really just brought it back to life for you? Uh, you know, I think the documentary brought it back to life. I, uh... Okay. You know, it's just, uh, yeah, I'm living out here in California. We're nearby neighbors here. And, um, and you know, I, I, I kind of brushed with the entertainment industry because I have stage sets in my backyard here. And uh, we offer film shoots, pool, a lot of poolside uh, uh, music videos. We've shot Wiz Khalifa, Trippy Red, Tyrese, uh, Block Boy and Joji, all your favorites, Jeff. Uh, have performed here uh, in, in music videos that will live on forever. We had Snoop Dogg do a, a music video with TLC on my roof and then in the backyard here. And so, you know, it's kind of nice to still be in the industry a bit. 
uh, we've done feature films back here, segments of it. And, um, but now here we go. I'm returning back into the, you know, spooky world, spooktacular spotlight, uh, which is happening right now. I mean, uh, we're heading to Sitka's Film Festival, uh, which is huge. It's the largest independent film festival in the world. And we have been uh, nominated for Best Documentary. So we're up for consideration. And it is, um, it is Oscar approved. So it's like, oh, my God, here, here we go again. This is just a wild train. Reminds me of the old spooky world days. It's it's unbelievable. Now we are winding down. I want to get to some of these Q and A questions. Uh, Bettina Messina wants to know: Will there be a Boston area screening of the documentary? Yes, uh, we are looking at offers for wide release, and uh, you know we'll soon know uh, when it will be released. All right. So I got the website up on the on the screen right now. Spectacular the movie dot com. Make sure I, there's probably a place to sign up on that website. Yes. Um, so do that. Um, someone wants to know, did Tom Savini help you to connect with Kane Hodder? Was that a connection for you? No, there? actually, I did. on I did it on my own on that one. You know, Tom actually uh, came in as a celebrity in year one, but I already brought in Kane and Gunner and, and Butch uh, right from day one. You know, they, they were there on the 1st of October. Very cool. And, you know, my discussion with Kane was, you know, he's never seen anything like this because there wasn't anything like this. And he wasn't even sure if his autograph would be of interest to people. But we I had a convincing argument. But, you know, basically I gave everybody an appearance fee because they were taking a risk in year one. Yeah. Elaine Swain asks, is Spooky World in Litchfield, New Hampshire, a part of your original Spooky World or is it an independent entity? Well, it's yes and no, Elaine. Uh, we sold them the rights. We storyboarded some of the haunts, uh, you know, and they and they, they they truly followed the formula for success. I mean, I, from my, what I understand, they're doing quite well. Uh, they initially started with haunted houses, and they've added this elaborate hayride, and. Um, I flew out in uh, the first year to see the hayride. It was wonderful. And I heard it was greatly improved since then. And, you know, they follow a great formula of adding on and improving. So that is wonderful that they have a, you know, a heartfelt commit commitment to, uh, you know, deliver great entertainment. I actually went last year and was pleasantly surprised uh, because Sweet. I haven't, I hadn't been since Foxborough and, uh -huh. I was back east and I was like, you know, let me see what's become of Spooky World. And I, I had a really good time with my sister. So, Oh, that's so, nice. Yeah. Uh, Scott's, Scott wants to know what became of the barns and other buildings in Berlin when you were asked to leave and not return? What is there today? You know, that's, you know, that's highlighted in the end of our documentary, Spooktacular. And that's a good question. Brian Stevens, um, who uh, is the ambassador for Down syndrome uh, fundraising efforts, has purchased the property and has made it into a very elaborate um, co car collectible museum. And he's also building a wing to include, you know, original memorabilia and information about the original Spooky World that was at that location. Okay. So that's under, they're putting in millions of dollars that's under construction right now. I didn't realize they were going to have a little spooky world section. I love to hear that. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Alexandra, who has been super helpful getting the word out about this. Thank you, Alexandra. Wants to know, do you enjoy <laughs> going to haunted attractions yourself now? Or did you just connect the business side mainly? I I go to haunted attractions that are local. I'm constantly invited to uh, a number of the places. You know, you got to remember we start, you know, in year one uh, at a trade show, I had uh, JCs, you know, little fundraiser events and some home haunters who would come to my booth at Ruby's and ask me for advice. And so I said to them, you know, I can't do this during the day. I'm writing up orders for my clients here, but come to my hotel suite tonight and uh, 
and I mentioned this to a number of people, well, I get back to my hotel and there's 40 people waiting to get in my hotel room. And they're all, I open up the doors, they're all sitting on the floor. And I said, we need to work on insurance. We need to share uh, ideas of haunts. We need to have, you know, connect with each other to help promotions. And so I, from that day, started the Haunted House Association. And so as a result of that, I'm still in touch with a number of Haunted House members. And some of those members invite us to their events. Uh, in fact, we just went to one in Austin, Texas. They heard about us and they supported our, our film out there. And, uh, you know, it was just a thrill to be able to, you know, just see the evolution of where the industry is right now. So, yeah, we, we do. My Cindy and I, my wife and I go to these attractions uh, every fall. Excellent. we got a couple questions left, and I know just a couple of minutes. I know you're running off to a convention right after this. So let's see if we can get through these real quick. Have you noticed inspiration from Spooky World and other hay rides and scare events in today's age? Uh, the inspire, yeah, I mean, I see some of the things that we did. You know, what frustrates me more is some of the things, you know, that they could be doing, but they don't do. But, I want a mouse know, girl. I want a mouse girl back. I remember I, you seeing would that think that, that there was, so, I got to tell you, that was labor intensive because you have to clean the cage and treat the mice nice. Uh, you know, we had a lot of protest, as you know, from PETA. They were actually picketing spooky world back in the 90s good marketing and, david it's good well marketing. here's what we did here's what we did as you know already um uh, we hired a pet psychic we hired a veterinarian and we hired somebody else psychic veterinarian uh well anyway they would come in sunday night after the weekend run and on monday morning we had them on all of the radio talk shows and I remember Howie Carr saying, how are the how are the mice doing? And the pet psychic would say, well, I channeled with them last night. They are happy. They love David. And David's going to treat them so well. They're being fed properly. And, of course, then the veterinarian would come on to, with Howie Carr or whoever the radio group was and say, oh, no, there's no signs of stress. They're not biting each other's tail. And, of course, this is fodder for these uh radio talk shows so every monday we got a huge amount of free press because we would have a mouse update <laughs> i love it and last question for you david uh what do you miss the most about running a haunt and what are you glad to have off of your plate i'm going to tell you what i miss the least opening night we had 10 portalets and i remember at the end of the night when everybody was exhausted and leaving, I would clean the portals. <laughs> I would refresh the toilet papers and the paper towels and the, oh, and by the way, those 10 portalets, by the end of the week were 20 portalets. <laughs> by the time we got to Foxborough, they weren't portalets, they were trailers and they had water systems to wash your hands. We even had an Elvis in the men's room singing and we had a Bobby Soxer singing Grease in the ladies' room. And we made that part of the show. And by the way, my staff said, you'll never be able to, you know, my manager said, you'll never be able to staff those positions. On the contrary, the tip jar alone was a couple of hundred dollars a night <laughs> in so addition funny. to the pay. David, I cannot thank you enough. I know you're super busy. I know you're getting ready to fly out of the country for another screening, going to a convention today. So if you need to hop right now, I completely understand while we wrap things up. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, sir. Stories. It's been a Appreciate pleasure. It. Thank yeah, you. And thank you, Mina. Yep. I wanted to add in my thanks. This has been fascinating. And just the fact that we got um, stuff that you aren't talking elsewhere just makes me feel like yeah, this was meant to happen. So thank you, David, for your time. Jeff. My pleasure. <laughs> it's been fun. I can't wait for everybody to hit uh hit uh the wherever you are now, going to spooky spooktacular, I hope for well, sure. Look out for spooktacular. If you want to go to the website again, it's uh spooky uh, spooktacularthemovie.com. 
That's right. Uh, and yeah. And uh, I also want to mention that David was on my podcast, that Halloween podcast, where every single day this month we're talking, we're creating a Halloween music playlist. So a new song is revealed every day. David came on to talk about the Monster Mash already, but <laughs> check that out, uh, that Halloween podcast, or if you're listening to podcasts, the podcastnetwork.com on your screen right now for the, the website. And we got three more of these, Mina, right? Coming up? Yeah. Next week, we're talking about Bear's Haunted Mansion. I put a link in the chat for everybody to sign up for it because it's going to be just as good as this one. And um, we're doing this all month. So thank you, Jeff, for putting this together. And I look forward to seeing everybody again next Saturday. Yeah, and I want to mention that we also have Delusion from 13th Floor Entertainment Group. Phenomenal, phenomenal uh, interactive haunt you should check out, as well as Old Juliet Haunted Prison. So every weekend this month, Come on back. I hope you enjoyed this and thanks for having me. Absolutely. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye. Bye.